comments, uh, criticisms, corrections, what, whatever else. So um, th this is the, the history of the East End of Eastbourne. So here we are. This is the East End about a thousand years ago. The whole of that red area was underwater. That was sea. And it just gives you an example of what a dynamic coastline this is. And uh, really at the top of the red bit there, that's Hailsham. And Hailsham was on the seashore just a thousand years ago. Quite remarkable, the change that there's been. And the, the volatility of this coast and its, uh, its, its dynamism is, is really sort of quite important in looking at the history of Eastbourne. Now here's a, a little diagram, you can see the, the lower dotted line, that, that shows where the Crumbles was just around 1750. Look how far out to sea Langley Point is, about one and a half miles further out than it actually is now. Uh, so you can see how, how, how important these changes are. And it is, in fact, this shingle bank that's built up only over about seven or 800 years that protects Eastbourne and its surroundings from being inundated by the sea. It may not be there forever, who knows. And uh, here's a, uh, an extract from a map from about uh, 1820. And uh, you can... You can see along this line here, that's, that's the line of seaside. The pier is round about there. This is a lovely straight road seaside because it was a turnpike road up until about 1870. So quite a high standard of construction. And of course you can see uh, Old Town and the Southbourne area and a little bit of sea houses. This is the beginning of the East End. Now there'll be a lot of people who who've heard of the Crumbles and say, oh, that's a bit of beach, isn't it? Sort of somewhere near, somewhere near to Asda. Well, it is, but the crumble starts at the Queen's Hotel and runs, and, and the seaside, seaside is, in fact, the northern boundary of the Crumbles. So the whole, <laughs> really, the, almost the whole of the eastern part of Eastbourne is built on shingle. And for a long time, it was called the Waste and sometimes people called it the Eastbourne Desert because it was a total waste. When the, uh, the manor of Eastbourne was sold off and divided in 1555, it was really divided between three families. Um, the, the northern bit sort of went to the Parker family, uh, which sort of ended up as the, the Freeman Thomases and eventually Lord Willingdon, that's uh, Ratton and Willingdon. Uh, about 70% of the rest ended up with the Duke of Devonshire's family eventually, and the, other, um, uh, and the remainder of that ended up with the Davis Gilberts. So in terms of the development of Eastbourne, the land ownership was incredibly focused. And if you actually look at all the resorts around the country, um, the focus of land ownership was second only to Skegness, believe it or not. Uh, so that, and that made the, um, the ability to build what was to be known as the special project uh, quite easy. And just a, an example of, of how uh, remote uh, the, the crumbles initially were. Uh, I can remember as a lad walking for miles and miles, and uh, it did seem an absolute wilderness. So here's a, a little um, painting. This was round about 1840. Uh, this is uh, sea houses. Um, wouldn't have had a population of more than 1,000. Um, a few boarding houses, a, a few villas, fishermen's cottages, um, uh, acted as a, a little uh, minor harbour, bringing in coal, etc. Uh, the fishing fleet active, and uh, that was about it. And uh, here you can see this is just uh, really where the Queen's Hotel is now. Building on the right was Field House. Uh, the, the building on the left was originally a horizontal windmill uh, and uh, uh, then, then used as a, a, a boarding house. And in fact, the, the grandchildren of George III stayed there. And that's when, I suppose, Eastbourne started to have some uh, sort of prominence uh, as a as, as, a, as a, a place of leisure. And then everything changed. 1849, the railway came to Eastbourne. Everything changed in terms of uh, the, the, the potential of the place. And 
Very, very quickly, the, the special project started, uh, funded by the Duke of Devonshire. It w was really a major development initiative, quite high risk really, to build a resort, a special development of the highest calibre for the highest calibre people. That's all that he was interested in, nothing else was relevant at all. Uh, this is uh, Cavendish Place in the early days. And it's interesting that uh, Frederick Engels, uh, the co-author of the uh, Communist Manifesto, uh, had a holiday home here uh, for, for about 20 years. And how interesting that there's no blue plaque on a wall anywhere. <laughs> and in fact, his uh, ashes were spread at Peachy Head when he died. So, Frederick Eng Engels, Cavendish Place. And this is part of the grand project. This is a Blackwater Road a area, probably 1860s, going into the 1870s. These wonderful, expensive villas being built. Some of them occupied for only a few weeks of the year for the, the highest color, caliber people to come to uh, this high quality watering place by the sea. That uh, blank area on the right hand side is where the uh, Devonshire Park Theatre and Devonshire Park were eventually created. So this is George Wallace, the first mayor of Eastbourne, who says we have our high class villa town, we have our artisan town, that's the area essentially from Terminus Road down to the Leaf Hall, um, that where uh, trade, necessary trade, was tolerated. And that's all, just tolerated. Uh, and we have our terrace houses uh, and they are all quite separate. And this, this idea of zoning and separating uh, the area out was very important to the development of the town. And here we are, this is sort of Devonshire uh, Park, um, after the theatre was built, so probably late 80s, going into the 1890s, um, this, is, this was not a public park. Uh, you had to belong to a club by subscription to, uh, to be here. Um, only the highest calibre people, of course, permitted. Um, the annual sub was 40 shillings, uh, which is a month's wages to a maid in service at that time. So it keeps out the hoi polloi and uh, used for all sorts of uh, uh, social purposes. This might have been a, a fundraising event or something. So, the Empress of Watering Places, a resort of quality for the highest quality people, uh, big holiday villas, very short season. The principal part of the season was just nine weeks uh, long. So um, that had all sorts of effect on employment opportunities as well. Um, the Duke was very dominant in the town, of course, major landowner, major investor, and, and his stewards who acted on his behalf really sort of determined how things ran. And in the early days of the council, the council came into being here in 1883, very much sort of in, in fear, I think, of the, of, of the Duke and uh, they had a determination to carry on with the project, his project. Tone, goodness me, I could deliver a, a, a separate talk on tone. This notion of having the right tone is a major, was a major determinant of what happened and what actually didn't happen in Eastbourne for a very, very long period. Where else would you have a bylaw that said that dogs were not allowed to bark on the beach? That's, uh, <laughs> and uh, a massive resistance to excursionists. These are working class folk from London on their cheap train tickets trying to come down here and spoiling everything with their rude manners and their uncouth behaviour. And in fact, the, the council on a couple of occasions in the 1890s actually tried to stop the sale of excursionist tickets to Eastbourne. And there was, in fact, a proposal, never implemented, that a branch line should be built with a station at the end, at the east end, so that the excursionists, the working classes, could come into Eastbourne without touching the posh bit at all. <laughs> Very interesting, isn't it? <clears throat> so the east end pays the price. Now, this was the forgotten bit, because all these lovely, lovely homes and these rich people need, need servicing when they're here. Uh, very high unemployment uh, in the East End, sometimes in the, certainly in the 1880s, reaching up to 75% unemployment, particularly with an economic downturn and all the buildings stopped. Um, 
very poor roads. Seaside was in fact the only decent road. The rest of it just sort of crushed stone. Very poor housing conditions. A lot of the houses without any effective drainage or fresh water supply at all. Um, education, goodness me, the, the council in, in Eastbourne was one of the last towns in the country to uh, meet their legal requirements of providing state education. And uh, so a, a lot of kids in the East End, particularly in the 1860s and 70s, uh, they had no education at all. If you were a boy aged 11, you could expect to go out on the fishing boats. Uh, if you were a girl as, as young as eight years old, you can expect to go into service as a, as a trainee maid. Quite, quite incredible. A lot of outsiders flooding, flooding in. By the time you get to about 1880, uh, the majority of people uh, living in Eastbourne were from outside of Sussex. A lot of people coming here thinking that there were a lot of job opportunities, and in fact there weren't really. Nobody listened or cared. Um, the, the council was really intent on implementing the grand project. Um, and uh, the majority of people in the East End, of course, at that time didn't have the vote. So why, why bother about them? A lot of unrest, drunkenness, and in the 1880s, a very tough time, there was actual starvation. <clears throat> so we're going to take a, a look at the East End. We're going to do two journeys. We're going to start off near the pier. You can see bottom... Uh, left there, that's Fushiades. Everybody must know Fushiades, right. And we're going to take, a, first of all, a stroll along the prom down to what's now Prince's Park. And the st second stroll, we're going to start at TJ Hughes and go down Seaside, uh, uh, Seaside Road and Seaside, uh, down to um, what I call the Lockbridge Drove Roundabout. And I'm sure you know that. This is a, an aerial photo taken in the mid-1920s. Look how few trees there were in the East End. If you look at the same photo of the other part of Eastbourne, the West End, it's like the Amazon forest in comparison. <laughs> so here we are. This is um, before the pier was built. Uh, so this would be probably 1860s. That's Field House, uh, beginnings of a seawall being built there. And you can see the, the Burlington Hotel. In fact, the middle was the Burlington Hotel. It had private residences either side at the time. That was the first big hotel to be built uh, around about 1850. And you can see here, this is uh, eventually going to be the, the site of uh, the Queen's Hotel and the Colonnade Building, so that would have been the late 1870s, already up in Seaside. Quite a, a massive uh, building, the Colonnade Buildings, and the site vacant in front because a uh, field house has been cleared. And really, why I'm showing this picture is to just sort of show you what the prom was. You, just, you can just sort of see a very crude uh, seawall and just a, a, a very poor quality prom. And here you can see the Queen's Hotel being built. And can you sort of see the connection between the East End and the West End? Now this is sort of taken from the pier and you've got the grand parade sweeping down from the Wish Tower to the pier on three levels. And then you've got this little bit and that's the connection to the East End. Quite interesting. And that was the only connection between East and West along the prom for uh, over a decade before things were put right. Uh, and sometimes quite difficult to pass because uh, this was uh, known as Splash Point. Uh, and just a, a more modern picture. It's quite interesting, and I know everybody makes this point, but when you look down Grand Parade, towards the pier, it's interesting how the Queen's Hotel is there making a statement saying, this is the end of the good bit, you don't really want to know what's on the other side. So this is, um, we're, we're going to talk about Marine par Parade now, which really goes from the Queen's Hotel just down to, I still call it the Travel Lodge, Shoreview, you know, sir, that, that you know where I mean. And this is uh, quite a, a, an early picture and really sort of quite a crude, rudimentary sea wall, which didn't do very much at all. In fact, there was a, a frequent flooding uh, from, from the sea in, 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 in this sort of period. And here's, I, I think, a wonderfully uh, atmospheric picture. This is Marine Parade originally. Um, 
only about 120, 150 yards long, sometimes only six feet wide, but that was it. That was the Marine Parade. And contrast that with Grand Parade on the other side of the pier. Very interesting. And as Marine Parade comes down to shore view, it turns inland at the Crown and Anchor Pub now, and there's that great big traffic island uh, when it joins up to uh, Seaside and Seaside Road. And this just sort of shows you the buildings that were there uh, going around the corner. And one of the most prominent was the was the Eastbourne Library. There was a library here from about 1780, uh, uh, funded by a uh, private uh, subscription. And this chap, Gowland, who we'll hear a fair bit about as we go through, um, actually took over the library in, in the uh, 1860s and uh, was quite a, an astute businessman and, in fact, uh, uh, started off um, the, the, Gow the Gowland directories, sort of uh, street and uh, commercial directories. And that just sort of shows the completion of the curb. Those buildings uh, there in, in Seaside, no longer there, uh, bombed during the war. And the, the travel lodge is on your immediate uh, right here. And you can see the sign up at the top for Caffin's Garage. We'll come back to Caffin's later on. And on the other side, still, I still call it the Travel Lodge, Albion Hotel, uh, built in 1822 as a boarding house. Um, purchased 30 years later by Lord Ashburnham uh, for the use of his children as a holiday home. It's nice if you've got the money, isn't it? And, and then uh, various um, improvements and all these sort of titivations really added in the 1880s and the 1890s. So really quite a, an old established uh, hotel. It was the, the first private building in Eastbourne to have electricity and in fact the first to have a telephone and its telephone number was one. <laughs> Fairly easy to remember and apparently it stayed like that until 1966 when the uh, the switchboard was, um, uh, exchange was automated. And a little, little uh, early advert for the Albion Family Hotel uh, with in uninterrupted views from Dungeness to Beachy Head. And I love this thing in the middle, patronised by the leading county families. I think that's great. And here's uh, just running down from the Albion Hotel now and looking at the hotel in, in, in the middle that was called the Anchor Hotel originally and then it was called the Albemarle and now, and now today it's called the Riviera Hotel. It, it is interesting when you look at the parapet at the top, there's still an anchor in the stonework from the original Anchor Hotel. I think the interesting bit here is the fact there is no road at all. It is all just crushed stone and that's it. There's no promenade there and the beach comes right up to the front doorstep. This house on the right here was built in about 1840, but the house that had been on the site prior to that was in fact where Methodism started in Eastbourne. Uh, and it started with the, the garrison, the members of the garrison coming to town in the very early 1800s, uh, wanting a place to worship. And uh, so this was the first Methodist uh, place of worship in Eastbourne. Now, I'm, I'm sure this is Fushiard, is over on the left, and I'm really sort of sh uh, showing this picture just to make the point that the original building line facing the beach, facing the sea, was in fact the line on the left going down Marine Road. And everything over on the right, that great big wedge that widens out towards the redoubt, was just beach, was just working beach. And we're going to look at that. Now, this working beach... Uh, it was called the Staid. Staid is an old Sussex word uh, for a, a, a beach where you, where you land vessels. And of course, the, the fishing beach um, in Hastings is still called the Staid today. So this was the Staid, uh, very active, um, and between sort of water level and the front doorstep of any property was probably about 200, 250 yards. So a very wide tract of uh, working beach and uh, just gives you an idea. That's the Leaf Hall there, and the working beach really goes right to the back of the, uh, of, of the Leaf Hall. And uh, quite, a, quite an important place for the import of coal. Um, for those of you who've lived here for some time, you might recognise Bradford's Coal Merchants. You might remember that. 
And in fact, Bradford started here on the beach uh, in 1828, so a uh, very, very long established firm. And uh, a lot of fishing uh, going on here, of course. And I just want to talk a little bit about the fishermen. Round about 1850, there are about uh, 50 uh, engaged in, in local fishing. That had almost doubled by about 1900, because clearly with the coming of the railway, it, extend, it, it expanded the market for people to send their fish to market. Now, these, these chaps led a very, very hard life and were called Willicks, W-I-L-L-I-C-K-S. Um, it's an old Sussex word, apparently, for guillemots. At the time, there were no end of guillemots around Beachy Head. And all fishermen had a nickname, and the, the ones in Eastbourne were actually called Willicks. Um, and they all had nicknames because um, some of them allegedly uh, got involved in smuggling from time to time. And uh, so it was qu quite, quite clear that you needed a nickname so that you, didn't, you weren't caught. And there's some fascinating nicknames. I've got a list at home, apart from one chap who called himself Jonesy. I don't think he lasted very long. But, uh, <clears throat> and here's a, a picture of the stage with, with some of the, the smaller fishing boats, the, the skiffs or, or punters, as they were called, uh, right up to, uh, these were called Shinermen, uh, most of them built in Eastbourne, uh, said to be the best quality of the fishing boats made on the south coast. Uh, they were called borners and uh, sp supposed to be faster and more, maneuverable, uh, more maneuverable than the great majority of boats. Now these boats were put to sea for anything up to three weeks at a time uh, following the, uh, the herring down the North Sea through the English Channel and right out into the Irish Sea if they could. Uh, on a really good day, a boat like this could land 50,000 herring. Isn't that incredible? Um, it didn't do them very much good because the more herring were landed, uh, the lower the price was, and uh, there we are. <coughs> so, just very, very quickly, uh, this is, this is the, the sort of thing that they went for. Um, uh, I think what is quite interesting, the second thing from the bottom, lobster, crab, etc., uh, a lot of that was caught around what was called the Hoss, H-O-S-S, -S, uh, which are the rocks that the Royal Sovereign uh, Light uh, thing uh, stands on. And uh, oysters at Beachy Head. Now, apparently, the oyster beds at Beachy Head, up until the 1870s, were considerable. They stretched for mile after mile. And it was the Brighton fleet, a very large fleet, that started overfishing in the 1870s. And the entire oyster bed was wiped out within a decade. Very, very sad. But at one time, very, very considerable. So, inundation by the sea. Always a problem. This is about 1906. But you can see you certainly needed your wellies on in, uh, if, you, if you lived in seaside. Now, those cottages sort of over to the right between here and the sea... They always used to keep um, a, a bucket of uh, wet clay by the door called pug. And when the sea came over, they frantically would stuff the pug around the door to stop the water coming in. And you knew, you knew the water was coming down the hill because they used to cry, pug up, pug up. <laughs> so, here we are. Now this is... Uh, this is where stuff starts to get serious now. We're sort of really looking down from uh, the travel lodge down towards the redoubt. And the, um, the local council, well, in fact it was the board at, at this time, in 1879 got an Act of Parliament to borrow a considerable sum of money, about £35,000, probably three and a half, four million these days, uh, to, to actually build a proper sea wall. And we, we can walk along the prom these days and we think, oh, isn't this nice, you know. Uh, but it, in fact, uh, it is. You are walking along a very large sea wall. And uh, uh, you can see that the bottom of it there and the foundations probably go down a further 10 feet below that. So there, it's quite a, 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 a considerable thing. Um, built by Irish navvies. Um, a lot of uh, raising of the land level was required in, in building this wall and they actually built a temporary railway from the Crumbles two miles to here and imported shingle uh, uh, to, to help in increase the uh, levels. And it, it did of course mean that um, the fishermen who'd been on the stayed here um, were, were turfed off. 
and there's a long, long fight which actually went to the House of Lords, but eventually the, the fishermen lost and were actually relocated at what we now know as uh, Fisherman's Green. So um, this, this sea wall, very important to Eastbourne. And as soon as the sea wall is built, of course, all the uh, land behind it could be built. And the, I have to say the Eastbourne Council were quite clever because in their Act of Parliament, they actually assumed uh, leasehold uh, and freehold rights over the land that they were now making available for development. So in fact, the sale of uh, all the property interest more than paid for the cost of the seawall. So all, all credit to them. And uh, here we've got sort of... Um, uh, because you've now got a, a proper promenade and by this time proper connections to Grand Parade by the pier, you can, you can see that it starts to come into its own. Uh, the, the East End Prom uh, it really starts to operate properly. This is a, a, a bandstand that was uh, erected very early in um, uh, 1894 uh, and some people called it the Bird Cage. And uh, quite interestingly, interestingly, the first band to perform there on the opening day was the Brighton Corporation Band. And I thought, not a good choice, really, uh, to ask a rival resort, but still, there we are. Um, right, oh, goodness me, the old, the old bathing machines. There were something like 200 of these uh, between the uh, Redoubt and uh, Hollywell. And uh, they were needed because you couldn't change on the beach at all. In fact, you weren't allowed to change on the beach here until 1929. Isn't that incredible? Um, uh, except if you live beyond the redoubt, and we'll talk about that in a second. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> uh, so um, of course, this was a, a, a very uh, drawn-out affair. You sort of uh, uh, climb, climbed into this thing. A horse sort of dragged it into the water trying not to tip you over. Uh, you got changed and stepped out and a very coarse and rough woman called a dipper uh, shouted at you to keep hold of the rope so that you wouldn't drift off. And after a few minutes of enjoyment, you climbed back in, got changed, and then the horse uh, pulled you back again. Uh, not, not much fun at all. Uh, most of, the, uh, 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 of these uh, contraptions were actually made in Eastbourne uh, at, a, at a local boatyard. And uh, yes, goodness me, uh, bathing in Eastbourne, it was a problem. Um, if you were uh, east of the Redoubt, going down towards Prince's Park, then sort of virtually anything goes down there. Um, you could actually swim naked before six in the morning. Um, but after six in the morning, you were allowed to change on the beach and you could swim at any time during the day. Um, in fact, there was uh, one woman who made a complaint to the authorities uh, to say that she was offended by seeing people changing on the beach. And uh, they replied, but madam, you live at the Queen's Hotel. And she said, but yes, I can see them very well when I've got my opera glasses. <laughs> so there we are. But uh, g generally, the, the, the problems with modesty in Eastbourne were really quite uh, profound. As I say, you weren't allowed to change on the beach until 1929, and only that was uh, brought about by what was called the Macintosh Revolt. And 40 people fed up with the local bylaw actually dared to walk down the prom with their costumes on, covered up only by a long Macintosh. And the police arrested them all, and they were fined. And it all got to the, to the times, and Eastbourne became a laughing stock, really. And, and that uh, bylaw was uh, repealed very quickly. <coughs> so we go on. Here's the redoubt. Sometimes we can walk and drive past this, not really knowing what we've got here. A massive fortress built in the very early 1800s, really at the end of a string of Martello Towers and needed uh, to provide the manpower and supplies and all the rest of it. Didn't really fire uh, a shot, or certainly many shots, uh, in anger, but a massive, a massive thing. Um, one of only two like it in the country and a scheduled ancient monument and all credit to the council, after a long time, they really are getting the act together on the redoubt. And I think we'll, we'll see uh, great things from this in the future.
Um, this didn't come into the council's ownership until 1926, although the land around uh, had been under their control for a little bit earlier than that. And here you can see really the scale of um, uh, Redoubt Gardens or Redoubt Music Gardens. And the, the gardens themselves were built in the 1920s as an employment relief scheme uh, to provide uh, jobs for the, for the unemployed. And, and here's, here's the early gardens, and you might have seen this uh, bandstand before, uh, up opposite uh, Fusiades, and it was moved down here in um, uh, 1922. Right, uh, and, and that's, uh, that's a, a, a replacement bandstand, you, you, and you can see that beautiful um, Art Deco colonnade that was built behind it. And you can just see how popular some of the concerts were. This was in the, a few years, of course, before the central bandstand was built. And uh, the Redoubt Music Gardens were a, a, a major attraction in the town. And uh, some, some of the other gardens behind. So here we are now down to uh, Fisherman's Green, uh, opposite um, uh, the Beach Hotel. Um, the, the fishing industry here really tailed off from, from the First World War. Um, the, the young fishermen were all called to, called to war, of course, um, because of their expertise with local tides, etc., etc. Um, they were required to, to man the motor patrol boats, and once they returned a few years later, you know, the equipment was um, decaying and all the rest of it, and uh, other, uh, certainly the East Coast uh, started to take over, and the, the fishing industry never returned to what it was. Here's a, a, a nice aerial shot, uh, a 19, 1920s, of Fisherman's Green. Uh, you can see in the front that land given by the Duke for the fishermen, I think just about in perpetuity. You can see um, Seaside Road, Seaside rather, right at the top there. And you can see Channel View Road for those who, who know it. And then you've got this great big area here of the Crumbles, and uh, uh, by this time, it, 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 well, it had been acquired uh, to be the, the Gilbert Recreation Ground, but not very much had been done. And it's interesting, this area here, we now know as Prince's Park Lake, it is a natural feature. And in fact, you can see records going back to 1280, where this was being used as a fish stock pond by Langley Priory. So uh, 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 a very long-term natural feature. And uh, there's a very old uh, picture of, the, of, of uh, that area before work started. You see the gas works in the background, and the building over to the right is the Eastbourne Slaughterhouse. And Prince's Park opened in uh, 1931, opened by the Prince of Wales, of course, and really the last of a, a quite an ambitious programme of park development uh, undertaken by the council over a 30-year period. And uh, the, the good old paddling boats, I remember those, always gave you blisters on your hands. And uh, picture as it is today. Now, oh, a water plane off Eastbourne, 1912. This is just three years after Blerio had first flown the channel. So we're talking about very, very early times. A major fowler... Um, and a couple of other business people approached the council and said, we're interested in building seaplanes in Eastbourne. Would you like to come into partnership with us? And the council, perhaps showing their customary vision, said, we don't see much of a future in aviation. <laughs> and uh, they said, no, thank you. But if you want to do something, please do it out of the way. And the crumbles was suggested. So they did. And here is the seaplane factory that was operating by 1913 uh, and this is on really where the sovereign swimming baths are now and not everybody knows that there was a seaplane factory in Eastbourne for a town that had never made anything really it's quite interesting that the first thing it started to make was right at the forefront of modern technology at the time and of course this was very important in the first world war and, only two, uh, and over 250 aircraft were actually made here. And that, that's sort of some, of, some of the gang uh, who were involved. And there's a, a picture of the, of the uh, wing shop. Now, they, these sheds, 
survived a little bit until the, the Second World War, when they were stored, used for the storage of gas masks. And then, of course, just after the war, uh, some of the sheds were used to uh, house the uh, trams. You might remember some of the old electric trams at Prince's Park. Right, so we're, 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 starting, we're starting our journey, our second journey now, at the, begin, at the beginning of the Artisans' Quarter and going down Seaside. You might recognise this building, T.J. Hughes, um, and this was probably taken round about the mid-twenties, and this was Dale and Curley's department store until it was bombed. And Dale and Curley's had, had started off in Seaside Road just round the corner on the right and had gradually acquired property over uh, or at least a 10-year period and eventually did a major rebuild on, on this corner. So Dale and Curley's, a very important and posh uh, department store and uh, had a, a very high-class restaurant, and they had tea dances every day. And this chap, Cecil Sapseed, <laughs> difficult to say without your teeth in, um, uh, was a, a regular uh, appearer at the uh, Pier Ballroom. He often, his band often played there. But um, really, uh, really quite a, an, an upmarket store. On the other side, where the, the fish and chip restaurant is now, was Chapman's. And it was known very, very often as Chapman's Corner. Now, Chapman was an in incredible character, came to Eastbourne in the 1850s, uh, immediately went into the, uh, the, the hackney carriage business with horses, did a lot of stagecoach and, 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 and freight work, and uh, certainly by the time it got to around 1900, had over 400 horses in harness and had a virtual monopoly of the, of the hackney cab uh, business in Eastbourne. And uh, at the time, he was said to be the town's largest ratepayer because of all the property that, that, uh, that he owned. Um, when the council uh, decided that they were uh, going to run the local bus company, it was it 1903, um, uh, this guy uh, was uh, most put out, of course, because uh, the, the, the council sort of assumed a monopoly over the situation. Uh, but uh, he wasn't deterred, and he went into the Sharabank business. And by 1910, this guy was operating two excursion trips a day to London, both ways. And by 1920, was not only uh, doing holiday tours of the Lake District and Scotland, but also France and the Italian lakes. Now imagine going around the Italian lakes in one of these. But um, it was the beginning of a package tour because the, it was a fixed fare going around the Italian lakes, two pounds per person per day. A lot of money, but at least you, know, you knew where you were. And the, the company, very, very um, uh, successful until about the 1930s, uh, when they sold out to an upstart company from uh, uh, Worthing called Southdown. And so there we are. Now here we are, we're, we're standing outside of T.J. Hughes and we're looking down the road, we're looking down Seaside towards what's, what's now the Cavendish Road traffic lights. Uh, the, um, uh, th those buildings there on the right aren't there anymore. The ones just on the left here um, are still, and that's uh, an old national school, a school that's actually funded by uh, donation. And you can sort of see generally the, the state of the road. Uh, no road was tarmacked in Eastbourne until 1911, but uh, uh, that, that would just be uh, crushed stone. And uh, I think it's a lovely picture, probably from a, a, a glass negative, I would have thought. And this is of, of a farmhouse uh, just along that road there, uh, which was called the Susans. So if anybody ever wonders where Susans Road comes from, this is it. This is the Susans. And uh, there's another picture of it there. It actually ended its days as a, as a minor finishing school for young ladies. Uh, now the, the, the property behind, um, this is sort of sandwiched between Seaside Road and the back of the Burlington Hotel uh, was the Elms. It was originally called the New Susans, uh, built right at the beginning of the 18th century and, and demolished round about 1900, but uh, a fine house. 
and uh, it was all replaced by this. Now, um, you're very familiar with that scene, of course, uh, but interestingly, you can argue that this was the first purpose-built shopping street in Eastbourne. Terminus Road had been built about 50 years prior to this, in, in 1850, but had been built essentially as a residential street and was converted later over time. And the conversion to uh, retail certainly wasn't complete by 1900, but this was, this was the first purpose-built uh, shopping street in Eastbourne. And as you go down to the Cavendish Road traffic lights, you just sort of look down and you, 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 could, you could see what uh, the scene was like there. And you just go over the lights and look down uh, the hill uh, and you've got uh, the, the big colonnade buildings on your right. Uh, the shops, uh, they were built uh, just before uh, 1880. The shops followed about 20 years later. Uh, and right at the bottom, you've got the, the junction with Bourne Street, and it was on that corner that the first Russell and Bromley shop in the country started in 1880. So it all started in Eastbourne. And you might notice here, uh, yes, here we are, Hope Brothers. Now, Hope Brothers have just closed in Grove Road, haven't they? And this is dated 1906, as, as uh, you can see. And a nice little comparison here between newfangled electric lights and the old style gas lights in the same street. Now round about this time electric, uh, electric lighting was quite slow in being installed and uh, at, at this sort of time electric would, well gas would um, uh, be ten times as many gas lamps in Eastbourne as there were electric lights. Electric lights at the time were really quite expensive, needed a lot of maintenance but on the other hand, they, 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 although the gas lamps were far cheaper, they weren't very good. And it was often said that when you had a full moon, you didn't bother turning the gas lamps on because it didn't make any difference. <laughs> now, if you were just to turn to your right, you would have seen this building, 1879, the New Hall. And this was really set up, and this chap, Mr Gowland, again, was uh, behind this. This was really set up to, to counter the very high cost of the uh, Winter Garden, the Pavilion Concert Hall, um, where it, it cost up to 10 shillings to see a performance, and it was half the cost at the new hall here. But it did struggle for, for quite a while and didn't really take off, and eventually became that. And you might uh, recognise it, of course. Um, and this was the first um, permanent cinema in Eastbourne, uh, round about 1906, 1907, uh, showing, uh, of course, silent films. And because of the nature of the projectors at the time, um, could only sort of show films for about 10 minutes before the projectors overheated. And then you needed another 10 minutes for them to cool down. So what they did, they put on variety acts uh, for, the, for the 10 minutes. And the, the acts were actually called coolers. And the, and the hippodrome from across the road would often supply the variety acts uh, for the cinema. And this is just a picture of um, one of the uh, uh, nice cafes that there was at the uh, colonnade buildings going down. At the end of colonnade buildings, absolutely wonderful uh, seaside novelty shop. I wouldn't fancy doing the stock taking on that. So. And then just beyond that, and this is, this is where that big traffic island is at the back of Travel Lodge, if you know where you are. And this is Caffin's first garage, 1906. Absolutely splendid building. Um, they were right up with you know, the needs of the market. A lot of rich people coming to town in their motors, and they needed motor stabling, as it was called at the time. And uh, you can notice this is on three floors, and it was in fact the first garage in the country to have electric lifts, and uh, provided really quite a, a comprehensive service. Um, and it was uh, five years later that they uh, opened their next garage opposite the town hall, and you, you know that, uh, that lovely building as well. During the war, this was used for the assembly, First World War, this was used for the assembly of um, aircraft. And over 70 aircraft were assembled here, mainly by women. And uh, 
do have to say generally that the First World War was a, a major opportunity for uh, the employment of women in the East End. Before that, they'd had quite a hard time. Now, this is uh, Aberdeen Cottage, and this is on the uh, other side of Seaside Road, and this was built round about 1850. And the chap must have uh, sat in his parlour window uh, in the 1860s and looked at this lovely view of Field House, and you can see the pier just being built, and you can see all the, um, all the sheep grazing. Then all of a sudden they built colonnade gardens in front of it, and he couldn't see a thing. And he sold up, and the site was used for the, uh, the Theatre Royal. Um, 1883, first theatre in Eastbourne, built by an architect called Phipps, really quite celebrated, built a lot of the London theatres. This is said to be the best um, unchanged example of Phipps' work in the country. Uh, quite cleverly, uh, the, um, uh, the theatre was built with these shops on the front to provide uh, income, and also up here, and uh, uh, certainly for the first 20 years or so, these were private apartments that were let out and weren't actually part of the uh, theatre. And I'm sure most of you have been in the Hippodrome Theatre. Actually built in seven months flat. Started in January, opened 1st of August. How on earth you build this in seven months, I really don't know. Uh, very, very cleverly built, but getting folk in and out very quickly and uh, would always have two performances a night, and sometimes three. Uh, so the, the artists were worked uh, very hard indeed. So here we are, we've gone down round the corner now, and we, we're just beginning to move out of the artisans' quarter into what I call the East End proper, and we're, we're, we're really at the beginning of what was um, a, a turnpike road. And if we just would turn to our left, uh, you might recognise this building, really quite early, about 1804, 1805, listed and was originally called the Ballroom House because there was a ballroom there and there were assembly rooms very often used by the local garrison. Uh, and in, in, in latter years, uh, some may remember it as the Busy Bee Cafe. And going a bit further down, again, we can drive and walk past this and not see the, the splendour that there is. This is opposite the Leaf Hall, absolutely lovely uh, listed uh, terrace of housing. One of particular interest here, um, this was um, in the uh, ownership of um, Charles Jewell. Charles Jewell uh, made his uh, fortune in Argentinian beef, uh, lived in Silverdale Road, and really from about 1910, 1911, did a lot of work with kids in the East End with, uh, with treats at the Winter Garden. And hundreds of East End kids were taken for a, you know, a, a picnic afternoon at, at the Winter Garden. In 1920, 23, I think it was, uh, this was he gave this over uh, for, uh, as an institute uh, for the improvement of young women to um, uh, uh, teach them their household and marital duties, whatever they were. Um, and uh, later on, um, it became a boys' club in 1959, and even today it's known as Charlie's and operated by, by the YMCA. Now, oh, we're getting to the big stuff now. Leaf Hall, goodness me. Leaf Hall, um, actually designed by an architect called Blesley, who also designed the Grand Hotel. Interesting. Um, built by William Leaf, um, a retired and very rich silk merchant um, who had 11 children and who um, uh, lived at what is now the Claremont Hotel opposite the uh, pier. Probably needed a big house with 11 children. Um, he was really upset by all the uh, drunkenness and rowdiness that there was in the East End and actually built the Leaf, uh, Leaf Hall uh, as, a, as an institute for the improvement of the working man. Because its, uh, its facilities were so good, it became a, a place of entertainment, high quality entertainment, I have to say. And, and people like um, even Tom Thumb from Barnum Circus in the USA uh, performed here. And uh, it was used very much uh, from, uh, by temperance groups and chartist groups uh, and embryonic trade union groups 
coming here for their little conferences at the weekend. So you can say this was sort of the beginning of Eastbourne's conference industry. And uh, after he died, uh, two of his daughters uh, actually started off this homeopathic hospital, uh, provided free to poor people, uh, which still stands, the uh, property still stands uh, at the back of the uh, Leaf Hall. And the other function of the Leaf Hall was, uh, uh, it, it was if, if you like, the, 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 the equivalent of, of a food bank these days. And we're getting to the eight, 1880s, when things were really, really tough in Eastbourne, a national economic downturn, the fish didn't seem to be fishing in the channel, it didn't seem to be swimming in the channel, um, real, 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 real hardship, real problems, very severe winters, and uh, a lot of people were on their uppers. And this building here was distributing 3,000 quarts of soup a week 3,000 loaves and 10 tons of coal just to try and keep the local population going. So very, very hard times. And here's a little extract. You can just sort of read it. It just sort of, uh, just sort of says how awful everything was. And I think we can all read that. So, yes, crikey. The date of that is very interesting. This was written in 1923 about Eastbourne and the East End. Interesting. So we go on. We're out in front of the Marine Hotel, again uh, uh, built in the early 1800s, and uh, the drinking fountain. Now, this was uh, uh, paid for by a woman called Mrs. Curling, who uh, lived in what's now uh, Trinity Trees. And it was provided because it was in, in response to a, a terrible outbreak of scarlet fever that there was. In, uh, in 1863 in Eastbourne, uh, brought about by lack of good water and poor sanitation, of course. And the local board at the time was very concerned about this because um, uh, stories got into the National Times about this terrible outbreak in Eastbourne and they thought it might hit the tourist trade. <clears throat> it didn't really worry about uh, too much, I don't think, about the 15% of children who died. And uh, you can see it now in uh, Sea Houses Square, uh, just by uh, Fushiades. And uh, I know that the council has got some incredibly ambitious plans to uh, totally renovate this square now, so uh, the future should be quite exciting. Um, this little building here, we've got our backs to uh, the Leaf Hall, and uh, we're just looking up Langley Road at that uh, 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 building probably many of you know at the junction of Langley Road and Pemsey Road. And this started out as private slipper bars, where you could go and, and have either uh, salt water or a fresh water bath. There was a dining room, there was a lounge and salon, and it was all very, very pleasant indeed. And Mr Gowland was running this. Uh, it only lasted for about five years, but it was also um, a laundry. And uh, it, it actually... Uh, the laundry, the Royal Marine laundry, actually ended up on the crumbles. And I put this up because I just like splendid open air drying grounds. And here you see Mr. Gowland. Um, laundries were very important in the East End. There were six major laundries because of all the, the big houses and all the hotels. And it was a major source of employment for, for local women, about the only source of employment really. Uh, so, yes, laundry is very, very important. Now we move on, and uh, you, some of you may know this, the EODS, or the old EODS rehearsal rooms, just in Seaside. Uh, looks uh, very minor in nature, but uh, you sort of go in, and uh, it seems to go on forever. Uh, this was uh, an old DOS house that the council demolished, and it was the first public investment, really, in the East End. 1902, they opened uh, slipper bars and the first public library. And uh, when, the, when the mayor opened it, uh, he, did, he did actually comment that um, uh, it was available for men only in the morning and ladies could only use it in the afternoon. They'd have no need to use it in the morning because they, they would be too busy with their household duties. It's quite amazing. So the, the slipper bars were actually extended in 1924 and the, uh, when, when the library was moved out. <clears throat> 
And going down the road now, a uh, pretty grotty building now, uh, this started off as the Empire Cinema in 1914, then became the Elysium, then became the Gaiety, then became, was it the New Classic or something like that. And a listed building, and this is why it's listed, an absolutely, super, it's said to be one of the finest examples of auditorium plasterwork in the country. And it's, it's going to ruin, I'm afraid. It's very, very sad. And it is a lovely little advert here. By this time, it's called the Elysium. And it's got, its sanitary arrangements are certified. And it's got up-to-date ventilation. <laughs> I don't know what up-to-date is. But you can see here, it's got variety turns as well. Uh, very, very interesting. And then across the road, you might recognise this building. Uh, this was the first purpose-built cinema in the East End, uh, the, uh, the Eastern, and then, then became the Regal. Uh, this, this closed in 53, 1953, and became a, a Woolworths. And some of you might uh, remember the Woolworths there. And next door to this is the, what was called the, originally the Sunrise Coffee House, built in 1879 by uh, a, a woman member of the, the Brodie family, who were quite considerable do-gooders and uh, philanthropists in Eastbourne, and built as a coffee house to try and keep people out of the pubs. And uh, ran sort of quite successfully uh, and, until uh, 1924 when it closed, and was then used for five years as the library. Uh, before the library was permanently accommodated on the corner of Fell Road, if some of you remember that. Um, uh, latterly, it was used as a bank, and now I understand it's going to be demolished and they're going to build some flats on the site. And next door, Christchurch. Now, goodness me, Christchurch. Um, Christchurch, the third oldest uh, church in the town, after St Mary's Holy Trinity. Uh, this one was actually built as a, what they called at the time, a chapel at ease for Holy Trinity, and, and became a parish and a church in its own right just five years later in um, 1864. Um, claims to fame, um, Princess Alice uh, worshipped here on a number of occasions, and Lewis Carroll, uh, actually delivered a, a sermon here. And uh, this was also known as the Fisherman's Church because it was always the, the local vicar who blessed the nets uh, for the fishing fleet uh, every, every, every spring at the uh, start of the season. Now, if you go to about 1900, um, this, this church and this parish the parish of uh, Christ Church had a population of about 17,000 or about 40% of the entire population of Eastbourne at that time. And uh, they, they had their work cut out because it was the poorest 40%. And uh, as a parish, they actually ran three schools, Provident Banks, Penny Savings Banks, all sorts of uh, youth clubs and women's groups and men's groups and all the rest of it. They employed two parish nurses because until 1905 there wasn't a single doctor in the whole of the East End. And they also had 200 volunteers. So if you like, this was sort of a, a mini welfare state because this was the only way that people could you know, have their health or their education or anything else looked after. And uh, in the grounds, this was a, uh, a school uh, built by one of the Brodie sisters, and this was, uh, uh, this, had, this was used for the education of a hundred children. Uh, it's still there now, listed building, and it's the headquarters of the Matthew 25 mission that does incredible work for some of the down and outs in, uh, in Eastbourne. And then across the road from there, originally, uh, was the King's Arms Hotel, um, and the area behind this that was originally called Tower Street and Tower Place, uh, this, this was all where all the naughty stuff happened in Eastbourne. A lot of drunkenness, fighting, prostitution, etc. In fact, it got so bad that they actually moved the police station into the area to try and control things uh, and uh, actually changed the names of the streets as well. Whether it made any of it to go away, I don't know. Demolished in about 1900 and uh, uh, its replacement 
uh, built just across the road, and I'm sure you recognise that. Again, a listed building uh, for the quality of its tile work. We move on, a seaside recreation ground. Now, this was actually donated by the Davis Gilbert family uh, to celebrate Victoria's Golden Jubilee in 1887. And this was really the first public open space available in Eastbourne. It had been preceded only by Devonshire Park, which was still a private club at this time. So, so really, um, quite, a, quite a boon for the East End. And just on the corner, this little building, listed and built 1910, said to, said to be, poss possibly, the oldest bus shelter in the country. Interesting, isn't it? And this is just a shot that was taken in, in the road just opposite. These are old coal carts. And during the summer, they did a lovely thing when, when trade wasn't uh, too vigorous. On a Sunday, they take out local kids for a picnic. I think that's a, a lovely uh, tradition. And we're moving down now to, um, not there anymore, the Archery. Now, this, uh, this is quite an old pub. It re really got quite a good reputation for entertainment. And, and, and at the time, often frequented by fruit pickers and flower pickers. And you think, oh, I wonder why. We'll find out in a minute. And now, now replaced by this. Uh, and the road off to the right is called Churchdale Road and originally called Destructor Works Road. <laughs> so so, so if, you know, if you want an attractive address, live in Destructor Works Road. Uh, we're going on that now down to St Andrews. Uh, this is the church built in 1912. There had been a, a, uh, a church on the site for about 25 years previously, and it was called an Iron Church. Now, at, at the time, round about the 1880s, 1890s, you could actually buy prefabricated iron buildings uh, from places like Harrods by post. And at one time, there were six iron churches in Eastbourne. So it's sort of the, the equivalent of the, of, of the modern-day temporary building. Now, this is an interesting map, round about 1913, 1914. Now, we've come along Seaside here, past the Archery, and we're now at where the Lockbridge Road roundabout is. And this is a little chalk track of the, of the old sheep drove. And here we'll, we'll see some gas works and brick fields, but it's really this. I want to draw your attention to. At the same time as they built the seaplane factory, they actually built an airfield. And this airfield, of course, was incredibly important in the First World War. Um, ori uh, originally started off quite small, but ended up as uh, something like 250 acres in, in size. Uh, and uh, aircraft were actually manufactured here and it was the, the centre really for naval aviation uh, during the First World War and most of the pilots uh, for the Navy were actually trained here. We don't sort of realise, do we, the sort of things that, uh, that, that went on. And here's a, here's a picture. There were about 75 aircraft uh, stationed here on a permanent basis and with a, a military personnel of just over 800. So really quite, a, quite, quite an enterprise. And the whole thing uh, packed up very quickly uh, after the war. In about 1919, um, the military, of course, lost interest. And the whole thing closed in about 1924 and quickly uh, became allotments. And the, the chap who'd started it all, Major Fowler, uh, was asked to, by the government to go to Japan to teach the Japanese how to fly. Interesting. Right. And there's a, an example of um, some of the planes, one of the planes actually built in Eastbourne. Now, this little railway uh, comes off the main railway line into Eastbourne in the vicinity of uh, Whitley Road Bridge. Um, built really quite early, around about 18, uh, 1860. We're going to follow the left branch, uh, and here's a, an aerial photograph taken in the later 20s. And up here, we can see where the airfield was, and already it's becoming allotments. Here's Seaside here. You can see at the top the seaplane factory uh, still there. These are the gas works, and here is what was called the ballast line. 
and the ballast line was there 10 years before the gas works were. And you can see here the old brick fields, a lot of brick making in Eastbourne, a lot of houses needed, needed to be built. And this is where the modern Tesco's is. And you can see the little sheep track still of Lockbridge Drove coming down here. Now, the, um, a lot of coal, of course, had to come into the gas works and byproducts came out and actual bricks from the brick fields came out as well. But the main function of this line was the ballast line going out into the crumbles. And here you can see it actually crossing Seaside Road. And this was uh, controlled by a chap with a red flag. And uh, so this, this little train made the trip twice a day, full of ballast, full of uh, pebbles from the crumbles. And uh, most of the railways in the south of England were built on ballast from the crumbles up until about the 1925. And after that, the trains became too fast and a different sort of ballast was needed. So we're go now going to follow the right-hand fork through the housing area to this now, these are the destructor works and electricity works. Now, the, the council, I think, incredible enterprise, really, in, around 1900, bought out the local electricity company and said, we'll operate it ourselves and built new, a new electricity generating station. You're, you may know this site as what I call the dump, or, sorry, the recycling centre, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> And uh, so, so that, that, that's where we are. And uh, again, with some vision, they actually built the electricity generating station next to the destructor works where all the rubbish was burnt and actually used the heat uh, for the production of electricity. And this area over here, uh, all the uh, transmission stuff, is still there today. And, and this area here is the is the old bus depot that we'll look at in a minute. But this, this was built at the time, very much on the edge of town. Uh, and you, you can see there, interesting gardens in front. And then if you look at the view, uh, going, and this is uh, looking south towards the sea, and there's seaside coming down there. The whole of this area here, right up to the 1920s, was market gardening. Absolutely vast area of, uh, of growing fruit and vegetables and flowers, etc., etc., and that's why all the uh, all the pickers were drinking away in the Artery Tavern. And uh, here's the uh, the bus de the bus depot at the top of what was now Churchdale Road. The original depot was a building you can just see on the left. This larger building was built in 1924. But in the older building, it was actually used in the First World War for munitions. And uh, again, many, many local women actually worked in the uh, uh, making shells and waters and all the rest of it. Won't go into the detail of local buses, except to say that it was sort of almost a, a political accident that uh, Eastbourne was the first area of the country to have its own bus company. Um, I think it was done quite cleverly to avoid having trams. There had been three efforts previously to try and get trams into Eastbourne, very popular among folk who didn't have very much money because they were very cheap, very unpopular with the upper classes who didn't like the noise and, and, the, and the smell and everything else. And in fact, the, it, it is argued by some that buses were introduced as a, as a method of sidestepping all, all of the pressure. Now, here we are, little old sheep track, Lockbridge Drove. Now, this was um, a picture taken probably at the end of the 1950s. You can see the, the white building here. This is the beginning of the Hampden Park trading estate, Armour's Pharmaceuticals, if anybody remembers that. And this little really old uh, sheep track, been here for centuries, really, in about 1903-1904, Freeman Thomas, the master of Ratton, uh, said to the council, I own this land, I'll give all this to you, free, and I'll give you the ballast to build the road, if only the council will, ma will maintain the road. And the council thought about it and said, we don't think there's any need for a road. <laughs> and nothing was done. <laughs> 
at, 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 and, and at the seaside end of this road, I just put this on because I just love Art Deco buildings. Caffin's major uh, w workshop um, built in the 1930s, absolutely splendid Art Deco. I just think it's incredible. Uh, 25,000 square feet of workshops inside, um, said to be the, the best body shop in the south of England and they had a, a real, really high reputation and demolished in um, uh, round about 1960 to, to make way for the Lockbridge Drove roundabout. And uh, we're coming almost to the end now and uh, here we are, we're moving into a new era. Mr Bird's Eye comes to town. Came to town in 1959 and actually stayed here until the early 80s and at one time employed 1,100 people. So really quite a, a, a significant change in the fortunes of the East End. And I suppose the, a, a new beginning. Here's, here's a picture of, um, of what the plant was like, and of course that Tesco's is there now. But interestingly, you can still see the line of the ballast line coming, coming round there. And you can see the first carriageway of uh, Lockbridge Drove in operation before it was actually uh, jewelled. So just, just to finish up really, um, we've, this is round, a map round about 1910. You can see the gas works. The airfield wasn't there yet. A few buildings in Seaside. You can see the Roselands area with the nursery and all the market gardening. And the vast expanse of the waste, the crumbles, still there and hardly touched. And you can see it now, just sort of uh, quite remarkable, uh, the change that there's been. And we're going back uh, to where we started, this uh, really just a, a few little uh, hamlets, a vast area of shingle and uh, the, uh, the, the, the marshland beyond, very difficult to drain, of course. And again, a map from 1910, just to show the scale of the East End at that time, and then sort of a uh, hundred, hundred years later, uh, just radically different. And we've we started out, I think, by uh, talking about the the West End of Eastbourne and how dominant it was, and how that was the major project at the time. And if we sort of look at at recent decades, it's all this that's become the major project. All the investment in major roads, ambitious plans for a wonderful town park uh, in the middle of the marshes here, the harbour development going on, a uh, lot of investment, lot of, lots of jobs, lots of new housing. This is where the future of Eastbourne is. And that's it. Oh. <laughs> Thank you.